everyone, I'm Barbara Beck, host of Welcome Home, where we love telling life-changing stories that offer us hope and inspire us in our walk with Jesus Christ. Well, when we produce Welcome Home, we're always on the lookout for new stories that we can make into a special program that simply spotlights someone's journey, that just tells the story. And today's life-changing story is simply that. We're going to take a glimpse into how God truly fashions His custom-made plan for each of our lives. So, sit back relax and enjoy today's life-changing story. Well, I am super honored today and excited to talk about this little bundle of energy that I have here on the set with me. You know I love him. You love him, too. He is Pat Williams, who is a co-founder of the Orlando Magic, and he's so many other things, too. He's written over 100 books. He has run in marathons. He's a great survivor of cancer. And Pat Williams, I mean, I just have to start off by saying I love you, brother, in Christ, and I thank you for being here with us today. Well, Barbara, the feelings are mutual, I can assure you, and I'm I'm tickled to death to be here. Well, and uh, always look forward to visiting with you. Well, you know, you're a consummate father. That's probably the first thing that I should have said, but you have had many, many accomplishments in your life, including writing the book Extreme Winning, which we're going to talk about. But how do you balance your time and do all of that? Well, Barb, I still work with the magic uh, on a daily basis and still have responsibilities there. Uh, I, I'm delighted that the, the magic have given me the freedom to speak around the country. And uh, once a week, it seems I'm on a plane somewhere to speak at a convention mm. or a conference. Mm. And then the writing of books. I, I'm doing all this <clears throat> primarily uh, to pass down to the next generation all that has been invested in me over these many decades. Yes. And I've had mentors, Barb. We all need them. Right. Uh, but in my early years in sports, uh, I had mentors that just invested in me. And, one in particular. Tell us about well, Mr. the one. Well, Mr. Littlejohn, Ari yes. Littlejohn, was the owner of the Spartanburg Phillies Baseball Club when I arrived there as a 24-year-old general manager. Mm. Uh, really wet behind the ears. And I spent four years with him. Mr. Littlejohn, uh, a, a strong, committed Christian man, but he had a wonderful quality, Barb, called wisdom. Yes. And I would say to anybody watching, when you find a man or a woman of any age mm -hmm. who possesses wisdom, mm -hmm. you hang very closely to that person mm -hmm. because wisdom is a pretty rare commodity. And Mr. Littlejohn had wisdom and he poured that into me. And now here I am, I mean, I mean, decades, 50 years later from my time with him, and I find myself uh, speaking as he spoke to me with young people, with potential job seekers, with those who are worried about a career change, or youngsters about where they go after college. I mean, I hear from somebody by mail or by phone or in person almost every day. See, I would never understand how you could have time to do that, but you really do. You place a lot of emphasis and importance on being there for these younger, for the younger generation. Do you remember some specific things that Mr. Littlejohn said to you that you've actually passed on some real specific strategies and tools? Well, Barb, uh, I've written two books about Mr. Littlejohn. John, uh, I, I could I can tell you right off the top uh, quickly six key wisdom principles that he poured into me. Uh, number one, control those mm. things over which you have control and release everything else. I could give you a whole sermon yeah. on all of this stuff. Yeah. Secondly, be patient, Pat. <laughs> be patient. And I was the most impatient, young, impetuous, young sports executive in the country. So did you listen to him? And he about pre being preached, be patient, yeah. be patient. Slow things, down. things don't happen quickly yeah. all the time. Uh, third, you've got to have experience. Mm. You've got to pay your dues at the ground level. If you get to the big leagues where I wanted to get, sure. and, and you don't have the foundation of experience, he said mm -hmm. you could really, as he would say, you could really stub your toe. <laughs> Uh, then uh, the fourth one, he said, uh, keep things simple. Mm. He said, life is not complicated. Mm. Keep it simple. Life mm -hmm. is basically simple if you just don't get things too muddled up and too confusing. Yeah. Uh, then he said, don't run from your problems. Mm. 
That was a big one with him. Mm -hmm. You know, because problems would descend on me running that minor league ball club uh, almost on a daily basis. I'd go out with my problems and want him to solve them, and he would always kind of be delighted. <laughs> that I had these problems. He said, you're gonna learn from these problems. Wow. And then he would say, this problem gives you a wonderful chance to sell yourself mm. to others. Is that number six? Uh, yeah. and, th and number six was take care of the little things. Oh, okay. He said, uh, stay on top of the little things. Huh. He said, before they become big things. Okay. He said, so deal with them quickly, deal with them right away and uh, don't let them, don't postpone them, handle them right now. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that was how he ran. He was in the tractor trailer business, the transportation of oil. Mm -hmm. So he was big on those little things yeah. uh, that uh, could gum up one of his trucks, or right. for example. Mm -hmm. So those would, those would be six wisdom principles that- Love that. Uh, that. I didn't even have to pay you to do that. Six yeah. things for, for us for, to have for free here. Yeah. I love it. Pat, tell me, where your faith and because I know you've been a strong Christian for a long time what part does that play in all of what Mr. Little John gave you? Well I came to Christ in Spartanburg I was 27 years old Barb I had uh, reached every success mm -hmm. monitor meter you know that you could in my profession of minor league baseball mm -hmm. and I thought that was going to be uh, the ultimate fulfillment for me, but it wasn't. There was a real void in my life, and uh, I was frustrated because I knew there had to be something else, something more. And through a series of events, other people that I met, I kept hearing about this personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I didn't understand that. I'd been a churchgoer uh, growing up. I went to a Baptist college. In fact, my dorm at Wake Forest was right next to the chapel. <laughs> but somehow or other, that, missed it. that personal yeah. relationship right. had gone over my head. I just yeah. hadn't functioned or grasped mm -hmm. it. But eventually, in Spartanburg, I began to see and hear. And, uh, and that's where I went to Mr. Little John one day. I never will forget it, mm -hmm. telling him what was really um, on my heart. And I, I just poured my heart out to him. And he said, Pat, this is your time. This is your moment. And right there in his office, about quarter of four in the afternoon, Feb 22nd, 1968. Mm -hmm. Oh, I remember it like it was yesterday. Wow. Uh, I, I collapsed into his arms, weeping. Oh. Uh, but when I f got straightened out, I, uh, something had tra there, there was a transaction that had taken mm -hmm. place. And I knew right there that was my moment. And Christ had come into my life and into my heart. Gosh, Barb, that was almost 50 years ago. That's amazing. And uh, it's real. Yeah. It's real. I well, mean, it I tell from people, the head. and I tell people, Barb, instant conversion can happen. Sure. I mean, sure. instantaneous conversion. That was right. the case in my life. So, yeah. you know, I've heard that though, Pat, with other people who have been alcoholics or drug addicts, that they had an instantaneous conversion, where yeah. that desire for that drug doesn't happen very often. But God can do that. He's the God of miracles, and yeah. He did a definite miracle in my life. He did one, Pat, obviously in yours. So, people listening today, you know, who may be on the Five yard line, you know, yeah. they, they're yeah. church goers and they read their Bible, but they just mm -hmm. never have really made that final thrust. Well, the final thrust is saying, Jesus, I want you to come into my heart mm -hmm. and I'm surrendering to you mm -hmm. and uh, I'm going to turn my life over to you. It, it can be very scary. Yeah. It, it can be very, yeah. people, very risky, people might think. But I guarantee you, uh, when you thrust yourself and allow Jesus to take over, it's going to work. Sure. Just well, it's, relax. It's going to work. It's <laughs> going to be better than you ever could imagine. And relinquishing control is yes. not always an easy thing. And I think a lot of times, Pat, people think, well, I have the head knowledge. I know who Jesus is. He's my Savior. But is he your Lord? Yeah. Can you take it from the, the head down to the 12 inches down to your heart? That heart knowledge of Jesus is a totally different kind of a conversion and an understanding of Jesus as Savior. Pat, I want to tell you something that you told me years ago, because we've known each other for many, many years now. And this is something that I've kind of, I mean, there are a lot of things you've told me that I have loved and, rel and have read a ton of your books as well. But one thing was you always talked about having an answer for people. Always be ready with a response. You might always have a 15 minute speech in your head that you might have to give. And I cannot tell you how many times I've been asked to speak on the spot. I need to have something ready to go. Do you remember that that piece of advice that you yeah. told me? You have that. In your, and I've, I've passed it along to my son-in-law because he's oftentimes 
asked to speak, and he always has, and you had a name for it, a certain kind of special speech that you always have in your back pocket. You know, you can roll it out on Christmas Eve. Yeah, that's right. And give it. So that's you, right. Barbie, perfect example, you asked me about Mr. Little John and some of his yes. wisdom principles. Well, yeah. that's a speech that I give. It is. Six, six things that he I, imparted I've, to I've you. I've written a book about it. I've, yeah. taught, I've used that in Sunday school classes, uh, built around the yeah. whole thing of wisdom. Uh, if you asked me to speak right now on the seven sides of leadership, yeah. Yeah, I could give you a quick, a quick hour on I that part. I know part, you could. So. And you've done that before because we've talked about one of your books that had to do with those, those traits of, of somebody who is a great leader. Give us just three of them. I'm not going to ask you to do all of them, but just tell our viewers today what it takes because there may be viewers with sons and daughters and grandchildren and they're really trying to be these role models and mentors. Well, how do, what do we need to be teaching our children about becoming effective leaders? Seven things one oh, must do. Say all seven I'm going to give you a poem. Okay. Seven things one must do to be a leader right and true. <laughs> Have vision that is strong and clear. Communicate so they can hear. Have people skills based in love and character that's far above. The competence to solve and teach and boldness that has fearless reach. A serving heart that stands close by to help assist and edify. So I feel, Barb, that those wow. seven principles that I just shared in that poem uh, are the makeup of great leaders. Whether you mm -hmm. study Jesus as a leader or George Washington mm -hmm. or Mr. Lincoln or Winston Churchill or Martin Luther King or Bear Bryant or John Wooden, mm -hmm. you know, you will find that those seven qualities are there. Now, is that your poem? Did you, was that an original? Sven Nader you? wrote that for me. Sven Nader was a longtime NBA center. Huh. He now works for Costco. Wow. But he has got this remarkable ability. That is remarkable. To, to write yeah. poetry. So I will, uh, from time to time, I will call Swen uh -huh. and I'll say, Swen, here is what I'm speaking on. Here's what I'm working with. I'll give him the raw material. And a week later, uh, this poem will come that's, back. That's an amazing gift. So he uh, he's, he's wonderful. I mean, You're also really good about surrounding yourself with people who are incredibly gifted, not just with those that you mentor, but you've always understood the importance of having people around you to speak into your life as well. You know, no, no question about John Wooden, do you want to talk about him? Well, we could we could do a whole hour on Coach Wooden. I, I know. I've written three books about him. He let me into his life, Barb, and it was a great privilege, the greatest coach in the history of sports. Uh, he was in his late 80s when I wrote and asked permission to write a book about him called How to Be Like Coach Wooden. Mm. Uh, he called me back and said, Mr. Williams, he said, I, uh, I'm not worthy of a project like this. Wow. But he said, if you would like to do it, he said, you go on ahead. Well, that opened the door and uh, I got to spend time with him in his last decade of his life. He lived till 99. Yeah. But uh, he was probably late 80s, early 90s. I. I guess about five or six occasions we would take him out to dinner or, or to breakfast. He had breakfast every morning at the same little restaurant, yeah. Vips, and they had a little, a little booth that was his, and a marvelous man. What did you like about him? Uh, humble uh, humility, Barb, would be, I think, the main. I mean, here's the greatest coach of all time. You'd never know it. Mm -hmm. He never lorded that over. He was just a humble guy. How did he treat his guys? And, and his players, you know, when, he, when they played for him, uh, he was tough and his practices were tough and he was firm, you know. But years later, uh, when they became adults, they all gravitated back to him. Hmm. And the fact that he lived to almost 100, hmm. you know, he would welcome them back at his condo and he had a different relationship. Then they realized what he was teaching them way back then. Right, right. Back when they were in school, they had three interests. They're in no particular order, basketball, girls, mm -hmm. and, and grades. Yes. But, uh, but Coach Wooden's principles and his teaching really hit yeah. much later when they had their own children and their own grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Then they realized what Coach Wooden was about. Mm -hmm. Remarkable man. I told you this in the green room that one of my favorite books of the 101 books that you have written would be the one on John Wooden. I learned so many wonderful things that he said and mm -hmm. so much of his of his character and his personality came out beautifully in Good. that book. And of course, you've said you've written, written three on him. I've only read the one, but I highly recommend to our viewers to, where, where can people get 
your books? Can they go to your website? And I send them to Amazon, Barb. Okay. Amazon's such a such a wonderful way to order books. The first book that I wrote was called How to Be Like Coach Wooden. Mm -hmm. Then I that the, might be the one I read. Then the second one was called Coach Wooden: The Seven Secrets. Uh, that uh, impacted his life. Mm -hmm. And then the third one was called Coach Wooden's Greatest Secret. Mm. Uh, one secret. That was the third one. What, Pat, what's the well, one I secret? Sat, listen, I sat with him one night <laughs> at dinner, and I said, Coach, you've been on this planet nine centuries, nine decades. I said, is there one secret that you have learned perhaps above others? And he thought for a minute, and then he said, the closest I could come to one secret of success would be a lot of little things done well. Hmm. That's what he said. Hmm. And, and when he said that, I thought to myself, ooh, that could be a book. Yeah. And years later, guess what? It was. It became a book. Yes. All right, let me ask Pat Williams that question. What is your one big secret? <laughs> Barb, I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm chuckling because uh, Andrea Doring, who is the one of the uh, editors, acquisition editors with Ravel, where, mm -hmm. where I publish, um, she said, all right, you had that time with Coach Wooden and we've written that book. Yeah. Uh, and she said to me, now what would be your one secret <laughs> of success? And I said to her, when your greatest talent intersects with your greatest passion, passion yes. you have found yes. your sweet spot in life, and that's where you want to hang. Right. And then she said, that's well, great. why don't we write a book about that? That's great. And we finished, the book is finished. Okay, what is that book called? Uh, it, it's called The Success Intersection. I love that. Uh, love Clint Hurdle, the Pirates manager, uh -huh. From down on the friends from the space coast, he wrote the forward for us, uh -huh. and that book will be out uh, Feb one. Oh, wonderful! So wonderful. we finished it. It's done. It's finished. I will say that um, just personally in my own life, I went a lot of years teaching school. Loved teaching school. Mm. It was wonderful to teach. But but and then people have since said, well, why didn't you get into television a lot sooner? And I said that was my training ground. But man, Pat. The intersection of my passion and what I love to do and with what my giftedness from the Lord, I'm in my sweet spot. This is what Good. I love to do. And, it, and and you hit your sweet spot early. I didn't hit mine early. Yeah, I was seven years old when I saw my first Major League Baseball game. Mm, that was it for you. In Philadelphia. And I knew yeah. I woke up the next morning, Barb, yeah. uh, with a dream. And by the way, Dr. David Jeremiah tells us that dreams always come when we're asleep. <laughs> that's pretty profound. Yes, it is. Dr <laughs> dreams. Now, vision, you know, that's... That's when you're awake. Wide awake. Right. But he said dreams, and, and that, and as I think back, when I went to bed that Sunday night after watching that doubleheader at age mm -hmm. seven, mm -hmm. uh, during the night, I had a dream of, of everything I'd seen and heard. I had a baseball dream. Really? And that night, yeah. I remember the bed I was in, yeah. my grandmother's house, and uh, I had a dream. And I woke up the next morning, Monday morning, and I knew exactly what I wanted to do with my life. Seven years I wanted old. to be a ball player. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and every moment from that point on was dedicated to yeah. that goal. Well, I did become a ball player, mm -hmm. you know, through high school and mm -hmm. college and uh, into the pro ranks. Mm -hmm. It didn't go much further than that, but uh, I flipped and the Phillies flipped me into the front office. Yeah. And that's what I've been doing for over 50 mm -hmm. years now. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's you have been in your sweet spot still, for a long Still time. goes back to when I was seven yeah. years old, Barb. Well, so so I encourage people to uh, seek out, analyze carefully, mm -hmm. what, am, what is a talent, what's my best right. talent, mm -hmm. and what am I passionate about? Mm -hmm. So when youngsters come to me uh, wanting advice about life, I tell them that little story I just shared with you. Mm -hmm. You know, figure that out. Now, now go get educated in that field. Right. And you got to get paid every two weeks. Yeah. That's important. Yes. And, uh, but if you'll go that route, you're, you're going to live a life of fulfillment. That's right. You're going to, you're going to really feel, and it comes down, Barb, to purpose. Mm -hmm. You know, Rick Warren mm -hmm. poured out, what, tens of millions of copies of the purpose driven life. We all are, are wrestling, what is my purpose? Why did God put me on this earth? Mm -hmm. And what is the purpose behind my life? And when you can discover that, boy, you're, you're ready to roll. That's right.
Pat, and then and then you'll be an extreme winner, Barb. That's right. Are we going to talk about your book? I can't believe we've talked this long and not talked anything about your extreme winning book, The Forward by Bruce Bochy. Tell us, he's a manager of the three-time World Series champion from the San Francisco Giants, That's I guess. Right. And then you talk about 12 keys to unlocking the winner within you. I'm not going to ask you to tell all 12 keys unless you know I'm in a poem. <laughs> <laughs> well, Barb, I've been watching in my years in sports, which now are... 50 plus years mm -hmm. and I've been watching some remarkable athletes, remarkable managers and coaches. I've had a chance to get to know a lot of them and observe them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've noticed that first of all, uh, they are absolutely galvanized and riveted by winning. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's called extreme winning. They're not normal. Yeah. And then under further examination, uh, I've been working hard to find out what are the qualities of these extreme winners. And I've, and I've come to the conclusion that there are 12 qualities that they all possess. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of those 12 qualities <clears throat> are also to the extreme level. Yeah. <clears throat> like extreme dreams, mm -hmm. extreme preparation, extreme focus, extreme passion, mm -hmm. extreme work ethic, mm -hmm. extreme responsibility extreme positive attitude, extreme goal setting, extreme perseverance, extreme competition, mm -hmm. extreme desire, and the twelfth one is extreme teamwork or extreme teammates. In other words, those 11 qualities can really take you to a great level, but until you do it as a team, uh, you're not going to be viewed as an extreme winner. So we've done a chapter on each one. There's right. stories and anecdotes, right. stuff I've collected for right. many, many years. And uh, I felt really good when that book came out this this right. uh, winter, well, this I spring, like about actually, it, late winter. And, so. and Pat, it's just, it's you know, there's certain things that we have to do. We can't just go out there and be a big dreamer and say, okay, just make it happen, Lord. It doesn't work that way. No, no. We have to take responsibility. We have to not only desire it and dream about it and focus on it, we got to do our responsibility. we got to do our work and, and our part. So I love that there's this strong, strong balance of the dream with the work ethic. If you don't have a strong work ethic, I don't care how big your dream yes. is, you're not going to meet it, right? Well, let's talk about the dreams for a minute. Uh, uh, dreams are wonderful, mm -hmm. but they will just drift off into mm -hmm. the atmosphere unless we take action. Yeah. In other words, as old Vance Havner said, you've got to stop staring up the steps <laughs> and start stepping up the stairs. That's, That's how he put it. Oh, I like that. That's good. And Barb, when you take action with your dream, there are three deadly killers of dreams waiting to pop up and destroy your dream. The first one is risk. There's risk to this. Sure. Oh, my goodness. And then secondly, fear. Mm. I'm fearful I could lose all my money. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid this may not work. I'm fearful about what my family will say. And the third killer is called change. Mm. Because when you start putting yeah. shoe leather to a dream, well, things are going to change. Sure. Sure. And as Woodrow Wilson said years ago, if you really want to get people upset, just try and change something. Yes. And so those three killers have to be destroyed by yeah. courage. Right. I think it's courage. Do you not? And boldness. And do you not have fear in your oh, own my life, word. Pat? Hey, Barb, let me tell you the <laughs> biggest fear. I moved down here 30 years ago. Uh, I was the general manager of the 76ers okay. in Philadelphia for 12 years, packed up my family. We moved down here in June of 1986. Uh, hooked up with a businessman named Jimmy Hewitt. Mm -hmm. And our goal and our dream was to try and bring an NBA team to Orlando, Florida. Impossible dream. Oh, Barbara, it was right. more than impossible because, gosh, we had no skyline. The airport, mm -hmm. nah. Yeah. No convention center, no Universal Studios, mm -hmm. no Swan and Dolphin, no yeah. Animal Kingdom. <laughs> I mean, oh, Barb. Yeah. And and I spent, oh gosh, from June until September of that year running around all over this city trying to sell season tickets to a city that had never had Major League Sports. There was no arena. Yeah. And, to a uh, sports team that didn't exist. And, and we had a, <laughs> and, and Orlando then was not that big a market. Yeah. Uh, but we ended up selling 14,000 mm -hmm. of those tickets mm -hmm. to a, to this dream that we had. And 
uh, the next April of 87, the NBA granted us a franchise. Mm -hmm. Now, was I fearful through all of that? You bet. Yeah. I mean, I would go to bed many nights thinking, Lord, what have I gotten into? Right, right. You know, but Lord, what if, this, what if this doesn't work? I've got six children with mm -hmm. two more on the way, and, mm -hmm. and wh wh what's going to happen? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I talked to the Lord an awful lot in that period. And so we just learned to overcome our fears. But I kept grinding every day. Right. And uh, and that's a good word, by the way. There are two good words here, Barb. One is grind, and the other is grit. Mm. Angela uh, Angela Duckworth, who is a professor at the Wharton School in Philadelphia, Penn, has written a new book. I've just finished reading it. It's called uh, Grit. Mm. And uh, she's made a huge study of this word grit. Mm -hmm. Interesting read. Yeah. In fact, David Brooks in the uh, New York Times recently did a whole editorial on her book about grit. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I learned an awful you lot at that period about yeah. grit and grinding every right. day. Right. And above all, staying positive and upbeat and enthusiastic. Mm -hmm. I learned that. Yeah. And having the right people come alongside you and having that you know, strong faith that you, you have. Yeah. You know, and so I learned long. about vision too, yes. Barb. Yes. You know that uh, that God uh, really is a, is big on vision. Right. Seeing seeing the future before it gets here. Yeah. Well, he's created our path for us. We just need to walk on it and to be faithful. And Pat Williams, you are a superstar. We hardly got to talk at all about extreme winning, but it will be it's in bookstores it's in and, bookstores and, and Amazon. Amazon's great to order books. 12 keys to unlocking the winner within you. We thank you so much. God bless you. Stay with us. We've got more coming up viewers. hope you were touched by our life-changing story today. We always see God's hand at work mightily in these incredible faith stories, these stories of hope in Christ. You know, there are times when we don't understand what God is doing in our lives or the lives of those we know and love. But here's the encouragement today. God is sovereign. Isaiah 55, 8 clearly explains, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth's so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. I can't tell you how many times I've had to bank on those words. Words from God reminding me that I don't have to understand everything, but I do have to grab hold of the truth that God's got this. In every situation, He is holding our hands and walking us through the good times and the bad, the dark days and the bright. Well, thanks so much for watching today's life-changing story, and we pray that you will continue to find comfort and hope in Christ. God bless you.